Okay, uh, welcome to chapter four. Uh, this chapter is really starting a new phase, the second phase in the whole process called the system analysis phase. And this is the first part talking about requirements modeling. And um, there's an interesting, uh, I found a really cool thing on the web I thought you'd get a kick out of, uh, talking about mistakes you can make in the requirements modeling phase. So I'm just gonna flip down to this website to talk about the things that you can screw up. Well, one of them is don't use any models at all. It's sort of like, oh, you know, models, geez, we don't need no stinking models. Let's just jump right into this project. We know everything there is to know about this and everything's gonna be just fine. <laughs> the next one is, okay, you're really familiar with one type of model, so let's just use that one. There's no need to confuse things by coming up with different kinds of models. Right. And then, of course, you can have the, exa the exact opposite, where you just throw in a gazillion models. In fact, it, it would take somebody with a PhD to look at your model and figure out what the heck you're doing. And no one else on the team can figure it out either. So, yeah, you can kind of overdo it. And then, of course, the next one is, okay, I built all these bright, fantastic models, but I didn't get any feedback until the very end of the process. And they went, uh, you know, you're missing a step there. Like, oh, geez. And then, of course, uh, this is what a lot of people do. is sort of like, okay, we're halfway through the project, and somebody says, oh, man, we forgot to do the requirements modeling. Well, let's just put one together really quick uh, because, you know, the QA people are going to be coming behind and they're going to want to see that model. Well, these are all recipes for disaster. Trust me. Okay. So, um, let's crank. Uh, so, again, we're in the requirements, you know, system analysis piece. And, and we're talking about requirements modeling. So, they've broken it up into chunks about, you know, the fact finding and development techniques, using modeling and decomposition. Uh, developing a system requirements checklist, developing interviews, questionnaires, and other ways of getting information, and then, of course, putting all the documentation together. So, let's turn to page 130, and let's get cranking. Uh, chapter objectives, I'm just going to skim through them really quick. Uh, describe system analysis phase activities, that should be pretty easy to do. Explain joint application development, rapid application development, and agile methods. Uh, use a functional decomposition diagram to model business functions and processes. Uh, describe the unified modeling language and uh, an example of a UML diagram. Uh, list and describe uh, system requirements, including inputs, outputs, those kinds of things. Explain the concept, concept of scalability. Uh, use fact-finding techniques to include interviews and those kinds of things. Uh, define total cost of ownership. Uh, conduct a successful interview and develop effective documentation. So those are the things that we're going to learn. Okay, on page 131 they have that that preview case again and again this is very good. You really need to read through that preview case as it progresses from chapter to chapter to chapter. It's actually pretty doggone cool. Okay, uh, on page 132 they have this little diagram and we're right here. We're at the requirements modeling. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> this is chapter 5 for data, uh, this is chapter 6 for object modeling, and this is chapter 7 for development strategy. So we're currently in chapter 4. <coughs> and the point of this diagram is to show this is not really a waterfall kind of a thing where you do step 1, go to step 2, and go to step 3. That's not really how it works. These things are all interrelated. Uh, so, for example, you're in the middle of doing requirements modeling and something changes down here in, in data and process modeling. Everything kind of synchronizes up together. And, in fact, there's some really cool software that can kind of keep all this up to date. Um, although, let me make a, a small rant um, regarding the interoperability of these three things. Uh, Microsoft Visio, a fantastic tool for doing these kinds of uh, analysis. Um, in versions up to uh, 2010, uh, they had a really strong modeling background. They had a, a model viewer 
and you can go into the model uh, explorer and poke around and and it would link all these things together so if you change something in a data model it automatically reached back and changed the the uml diagram it was pretty doggone cool and when the new version came out the visio 2013 um, a lot of people you know upgraded immediately because it's the latest and greatest version there's bound to be a reason to upgrade and they upgraded it and found out that the, that basic capability of having all these things linked together in a single uh, model uh, that feature was gone uh, I mentioned to you guys one time before or at least one time before that there has to be a legitimate business need in order to do an upgrade uh, in this particular case we lost functionality now Visio can still do diagrams but you go in there and you change a, a, a data diagram or a UML diagram and that's all you've done you've just changed a the diagram there's no link back there's no interaction between the individual pieces just a warning and an example of this concept that I've mentioned a dozen times already about there has to be a legitimate business need okay now how many times have I said that phrase what a dozen times we're only on the fourth chapter you really think that that might show up on the test somewhere yeah okay I'll get off my uh, high horse and let's talk about what we're supposed to be talking about so on page 133 they talk about um, what system analysts do and it requires some you know strong analytical skills yep of course and then an awful lot of interpersonal skills uh, again you're working with those pesky humans and so yeah you got to spend an awful lot of time talking with humans I mentioned to you guys a gazillion times before um, the typically the user cannot articulate the requirements that's why we do this requirements modeling and it sounds kind of crazy but the requirements modeling really isn't for you uh, because you kind of sort of know how things put together um, it's really for the other people you're doing requirements modeling to draw out information from these users who would not otherwise be able to tell you what the requirements are so again requirements modeling is not really for your benefit I mean come on it is but you know what I'm talking about it's not really directed to you it's directed to the users and it's to, it's to extract sometimes painfully extract information from uh, these users who have no other way of communicating with you okay so we're going to talk about the team-based approach we're talking about JAD and RAD and Agile yep okay uh, let's continue so <clears throat> uh, on page uh, 133 and into 134 they talk about JAD the joint application development and kind of an overview would kind of go like this it, it brings users <clears throat> into the development process as active participants in the whole deal in other words you you quite literally have a user sitting over your shoulder while you're working on a model and you're talking to them saying okay now I think uh, after this step it goes to this step is that correct and they go yeah yeah so you're actually quite literally working with the user I mean not a whole room full of users but a representative person uh, while you're doing the work that's the joint application development so it does require a lot of user involvement and the user unfortunately has to be um, a relatively competent person uh, now if you're working in a you know a factory floor and you're getting ready to do a, a process uh, redesign uh, you might find it tough to, to find uh, more than three or four people that actually have the kind of uh, expertise you need to be able to help you with the this JAD technique for example you can't show them a diagram you know as you're working on one saying okay here's the diagram here and I think the next step is going to be here and they're looking at it going what the heck is that uh, yeah they're gonna have to be relatively robust uh, people to be able to help out and there's no doubt you're gonna find them don't get me wrong I'm not dispersing these folks but um, you might not find more than just a, a small handful okay so uh, yes uh, the JAD has participants and roles on page 134 there's a cool little thing talking about you know they have a leader um, and you know whoever the you know the top manager is the managers the users the system folks and, and a recorder and uh, the whole point of the recorder of course is to keep track of everything 
So um, on page 135, they have a, a, an example of a, a typical agenda for kind of a, a meeting, you know, about introducing yourselves. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but, you know, just go down the little chart there of all the kind of things that you, you would expect to have in a, a joint application development. Now, um, 135, they talk about the advantages and disadvantages. Well, the advantages are it allows key people to participate in the design, which is fantastic. And they, uh, users are more likely to feel a sense of ownership. Hmm, let's stop a minute and think about that. Let's say, for example, that you put a system together and um, it has a pretty strong weakness. I mean, you discover later on that there's a flaw. Um, how likely is it that they're going to just scream and holler and complain about, oh my God, there's a horrible flaw, if they were active participants in the design? Oh, yeah. One of the reasons why you ask them to get involved is because they now have ownership. And if they feel ownership, they're a lot less likely to complain. Or if they do complain, it'll be a very helpful kind of a complaint rather than a hurtful kind of a thing. It'll be like, you know, I think we missed something here. Let's sit down together and, and see if we can figure it out rather than name calling and shouting. So that is a tremendous advantage. Okay. And it produces a more accurate statement of the system requirements because you by yourself cannot generate requirements. Uh, you might think you can, but um, it's probably going to end in disaster. Now, all is not well. There are some disadvantages. Uh, number one is it's expensive because I'm taking people away. I mean, you have somebody who works for a living, you know, doing whatever, and they have to come s s walk over to my desk and sit behind my shoulder while I'm working on a, a requirements document. That's taking them away from their primary job. And, yeah, that's expensive. Okay. And if your group is too big, you know, you start showing off a, a model. You know, like you go into, into a, a conference room and you pop a model up on the screen. He goes, okay, everybody, there's, here's the model for how we do, uh, you know, order fulfillment. Uh, does it look right, everybody? Well, if there's 15 people in the room, you're going to get a lot of humma, 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 humma. And, but, you know, you just can't make it too big. You'll, 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 you'll be hard to get through the noise, so to speak, to be able to get to the real thing. So, um, I use... The JAD philosophy of getting the, the users involved. Uh, I use the JAD technique all through the entire process, not just requirements, of getting the user involved and trying to trying to obtain this ownership. I will tell you, one of the toughest parts of this is to pick those one or two users that you're going to have that's going to follow you through the entire system. Um, usually, they're going to be the best and the brightest that's going to be helping you. And because of the best and the brightest, they're also going to be in the most demand to get other things done. So, yes, it is a tremendous imposition on, on the company as a whole to be able to do these things. Okay, <clears throat> on page uh, 135, we talk about RAD. And RAD uses some of the same kind of techniques we just talked about where you get the users involved. In fact, almost all of these techniques have ways of getting the users involved. So it uses the same type of group approach, and it produces a requirements model, and it's a four-phase cycle. And um, so here's our, our same old, same old. I mean, the requirements planning is where we're at. And then this user design and construction, instead of having this, again, instead of having this be a waterfall where I do step one, step two, step three, um, is a tremendous amount of user involvement in this entire process, where particularly with regard to the user design. Uh, you pop open a, a prototype, you show it to them, and uh, they say, well, that's pretty good, but what about this? And so hopefully you get an awful lot of interaction there. So it is pretty doggone cool, a way to, uh, to get uh, very good requirements and other type of information. Uh, this is a good place to stop for the 15-minute mark. And uh, we'll pick this up again in just a few.